back to the 60s. So something happened. It really was uh, a different period. So I'll start with the culture. Now, there's many claims to the 60s. Was it political? Was it psychedelic? Was it art? Was it sex and drugs and rock and roll? Actually, it wasn't rock and roll, it was rock. Rock and roll is the 50s. So I looked it up in Wikipedia. Let me get my laser pointer. So they refer to the Vietnam War, the Beatles, the assassination of John F. Kennedy, Martin Luther King, Woodstock, Cultural Revolution in China, gay liberation, going to the moon. So that's, but since the sacred icon of America was the automobile, let's start with that. So there was a great automobile designer, R.V. Earl, who was chief designer at General Motors. And in 1946, a friend of his took him to an Air Force base and showed him a P-38 fighter plane. He said, look at those tail fins. You got to put them on your car, on your cars. 1947, here it is on the Cadillac. This is my car. I owned it for a couple of years. It, I sold it a couple of years ago. And it's now the coolest car in Sweden. The guy in Sweden bought it. This is, I think, the classic. But what was the ultimate tail thing? 1959. Uh, <laughs> it came up to about here on your chest. It was a hoot. But all of a sudden, something happened. A whole different mentality comes. So, two term president in the 50s had been Dwight Eisenhower, a very grandfatherly figure. 1960, he gets replaced by John F. Kennedy. Young, vital, cool. He drove a convertible Bonneville. This is the one car that could take on a 290-fuel injected Corvette, which I spent my summers in. And he had this incredible wife, Jackie, who brought culture to the White House. At the same time, Norman Mailer was a World War II vet and wrote a book, The Naked and the Dead. And it was a huge success. He made it to a movie. He took his money and founded The Village Voice, which was an alternative newspaper in New York that looked at art, culture, jazz, stuff the New York Times didn't cover. In 1959, he publishes advertisement for, Advertisements for Myself, collection of essays. And he addresses, he advocates for the emergence of a new culture, a hip culture to replace a square culture. So square is practical, hip is wild. Square is classic, hip is romantic. Square is logic, hip is instinct. Square is white, hip is negro. Square is pragmatic, hip is inductive, etc. There's like four pages of these comparisons. But it's advocating a radically new culture. 
dominant TV sitcom was Father Knows Best about a plastic white bread family. Then comes along the movie Easy Rider. Anybody seen it? Put it on your list of classics. Um, the 50s saw TV dinners. We now value whole natural organic food. And we go to Whole Foods if we can afford it. In the 50s, everybody grew up with that. That's what there was. Synthetic food became, oh, that's the cool stuff. So here's a TV dinner. And then comes Diet for a Small Planet, advocating organic again. It's a period of revolution and the new left. Everybody had Che Guevara posters in their dorm. Mao released a little red book. <laughs> One of our Chinese students who was able to go back and forth before you were allowed to travel from China bought me a copy. And I was selling my valuable books, I'll show you some later, at the Strand. And I had a little red book, an original Chinese copy. They just laughed. They printed a billion of them. <laughs> Why would it be valuable? Here's Jean-Paul Sartre. Cambodia, the communists killed half the population. There's Abby Hoffman, American New Left rebel. Here's a Bible of the New Left without Marx or Jesus. It's a period of challenging authority. Things are a little um, on the edge right now in academia and American politics. That's what it was like, only 10 times worse in the late 60s. So anti-Vietnam War demonstrations. 1968, the whole world goes up in rebellion. In Paris, they overthrow De Gaulle. At Berkeley, there's the free speech movement. Here's Mario Savio at Brooklyn, uh, at Berkeley. Here's Mark Rudd at Columbia. The architecture schools led the rebellions at Columbia and at Pratt. Pratt was totally shut down. Students took over and ran the school. The school was run by an all-school meeting where the students outvoted the faculty 10 to 1. So they <coughs> totally took over the school. Sexual revolution. It was after the pill and before AIDS. So everybody took off their clothes and got in a big pot. Feminism. Betty Friedan's the feminine mystique. New Age. Everybody went to Esalen Institute in Big Sur and meditated. Did yoga, tai chi, meditation, studied Eastern thought. The uh, movement is documented in an excellent book, The Aquarian Conspiracy. Psychedelics. So I won't ask if anybody has had LSD, but let's just say it changes everything. My brother-in-law, a very straight doctor and scientist, took it. Next day he said, there are those who know and those who don't know. You can go to other universes. So Ken Kesey organized the Merry Pranksters. They got a bus, traveled around the country. It, their trips were documented by Tom Wolfe, wonderful New Age journalist, very straight guy, famous for wearing white suits, wrote some, a really terrific book on architecture, from Bauhaus to our house. But his book is The Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test. Timothy Leary was an advocate of LSD. 
And his slogan was, let's see, tune in, turn on, drop out. Comic books are replaced by underground comics, C-O-M-I-X. It wasn't Donald Duck anymore. Rock and roll, he was Buddy Holly, culmination of rock and roll, gets replaced by rock. The Beatles, the Stones, Carly Simon. Carly Simon's two sisters just died a couple of days ago. You know, bits were in the New York Times. Psychedelic posters. I, uh, if you get an original Art Nouveau poster, it's worth thousands of dollars. So I bought a whole collection of these posters, figure eight. I could finance my retirement. They're not worth what I paid for them. <laughs> they didn't go up in value. Major cultural figure, who's this? Bob Dylan. And he was so important, he won a Nobel Prize in Literature a couple of years ago for his contribution to the culture. And somebody mentioned going to space. And perhaps the most important thing about that was when you get far out, you can look back. Oh my God, it's small. There's the Earth. Bucky Fuller wrote a book, Operating Manual for Spaceship Earth leading to whole earth catalog, earth day, the ecology movement. Communes and free stores. So the center of the culture in California was the corner of Haight and Ashburn, Haight Ashburn. In New York, it was St. Mark Street, which is 8th Street in Manhattan. The Village Voice was old-fashioned and establishment gets replaced in New York the East Village Other and in California by the San Francisco Oracle. Very psychedelic newspapers. The Yippies ran a pig for president. Flower Children 67 was the summer of love. Everybody just went to San Francisco. And said, what are we going to do with all these people? They all took their clothes off. Then 69 opened with Woodstock. New great music concert. But opened, ended with Altamont. The Rolling Stones hired the Hells Angels for security. And they killed somebody. So it wasn't fun anymore. Some of the influential books. Marshall McLuhan, most important book of the second half of the 20th century. Herbert Marcuse, Attacking Capitalist Culture, One Dimensional Man. The uh, Tibetan diaspora, Tibetan spiritual leaders starting to come to the West. The first was Chingam Champa Rinpoche, one of my teachers. Uh, his book is Cutting Through Spiritual Materialism. And Joseph Campbell became prominent looking at how mythology, myths live in us today. Now a very important critic was Pauline Kael. She was the film critic for the New Yorker magazine. But what she did was, there were junk American movies and serious European movies. So she started to treat popular movies seriously, conflating high culture and popular culture. So that's the culture. If you're interested, no book can describe it because a lot of it was visual and music. But there's a movie, it's just a romance, boy meets girl, he's an American, she's English, or vice versa, I don't remember. And the music track is all Beatles songs.
all across the universe, but it really captures the mood of the time. Okay, Art, what am I going to show next? Anybody? You got it. So, our key figure is Andy Warhol, died young. Um, thanks. So, Andy began his career as a fashion illustrator and was very successful. He was the most highly paid fashion illustrator. Now let's look at something. Here's a still life by Cezanne, major late 19th century painter, very influential on the Picasso and Cubism. What is he painting here? His everyday world. Nobody in France had a refrigerator. You went shopping three times a day. In the morning, you go buy cream, coffee, and uh, pastries for breakfast. You eat lunch at work, and you buy dinner on the way home and cook it. So I had, uh, 1962, I did my junior year in Europe, summer. We, uh, my buddies and I got two motorcycles and drove around Europe and North Africa. But they had spent the whole year in Paris. And they had a really nice apartment that a relative had given to them. No refrigerator. That's how you lived even in the 60s in France. So this is where a grocery Cezanne went to the grocery store. This is what he would see. Now, why didn't Andy Warhol paint like that? When I studied painting at the Art Students League in New York, they put out a bowl of still life that we would paint because they'd have a model. But that's not the world. This is what Andy Warhol would see if he went to the grocery store. So his art is Campbell soup cans and Brillo boxes. Brillo is a scrubbing pad for cleaning. Why should Andy Warhol paint Cezanne's world? He paints his own world. Celebrities, who's the blonde? Now we know. Who's the brunette? Elizabeth Taylor. Yeah. But his most important artwork was himself. So in 1968, New York Times magazine section. Andy's in the middle. On the left is Viva. On the right is Ultraviolet. So Viva made a really cool movie, Lion's Love, by the movie producers, the director is Agnes Bartis. Highly recommend it. And uh, Ultraviolet just died a couple of years ago. He became a sculptor. Okay, architecture. So 1932, Philip Johnson and it should be right here. Henry Russell Hitchcock, sorry. Philip Johnson, Henry Russell Hitchcock. So Philip Johnson was an architectural historian and then became an architect uh, later in life. Henry Russell Hitchcock was the leading historian of the day. Organized an exhibit at the Museum of Modern Art called The International Style. And it launched in America modern architecture. So typical of the show is Corbusier's Villa Savoie 
and Mises Barcelona Pavilion. Well, it didn't have too much impact right away because of the depression, and then nothing got built except military stuff for five years during World War II. But coming out of the war, here we get Mies van der Rohe Seeger building. We've looked at it a couple times. And the building was widely admired, but how much of that can you do? So here is Harrison Abramovitz extension of Rockefeller Center onto over Sixth Avenue. These things just start marching through Manhattan and the world. So there's an objection to it. And uh, in the mid 60s, there starts to be a wrestling with Mies. So here's Paul Rudolph. Art and Architecture Building at Yale. We looked at that. Venturi's, Venturi calls it a duck. Very muscular, very corbu. Here's Khan's Medical Towers. Again, wrestling with Mies. And here's deviating around Mies. Got nothing to do with Mies. Here's Aero Saranen's TWA building in the mid-60s. And that's the time of Robert Venturi. Mies had said, less is more. Venturi says, less is a bore. So, but, that's kind of orthodox. This is still orthodox straight architecture. This is what gets in the history books, even Venturi. But remember, there's many claims to the 60s. There were plenty of people, whether they're architects or not, just dropped out of the whole thing and went and built communes. And all kinds of books, other homes and garbage, take off on other homes and gardens. Uh, the Book of the New Alchemists, the Whole Earth Catalog, a resource for tools, books, everything you need. Interestingly, the Encyclopedia Britannica began, if you were a British colonial ruler, bureaucrat, and you're in, say, India, you got to build a steel mill. You got to set up a government. You got to write a constitution. Everything you need to know would be in the Encyclopedia Britannica. So if you're going to drop out and start a new society, build a commune, everything you would need to know is in the whole Earth catalog. The founder, Stuart Brandt, is still alive. So here, Drop City, the first rural hippie commune. And what they would do is, at that time, automobile steel was not recycled. Automobiles were just piled up in big piles outside the city. Unlimited resource. You take an air hammer, cut up the trunk lid or the hood, fold it under, and you get your components to make a zone, which is a kind of, which is a kind of dome. Now in England, the school was the AA, still is, the Architectural Association. In England, uh, has had off and on socialism. Under socialism, the government builds most of the housing, it's public housing. Everybody lives in public housing, owned by the government. So the largest office was the London County Council. 
they build public housing. So you go to school, you do cool stuff, you have fun, and then you're going to spend the rest of your career doing public housing. So early 60s, a group of architects said, we're not going to do that. And they became known as Archigram. So here are their members. I'm not going to go through them. But they're futurists, pro-consumer, inspired by, at the same time, satirizing technology. And they made drawings. Later, they did a couple buildings. And some of them have uh, taught at Pratt. So the first thing I did is start a magazine, publish their drawings. But they were not going to make a conventional slick architecture magazine. They made it a comic book, The Amazing Archigram 4. The most famous project is Peter Cook's Plug-in City. So Cook observes that Buildings come and go, but the infrastructure is pretty there. So the road, sidewalk, sewer, <coughs> water, electric, cables are all in the grid of the street. And then you plug buildings into that. What if that infrastructure grid were three-dimensional? And what if we don't only plug in the buildings, we plug in the individual units? So every three years you trade in your car and get a new car. Why not every three years you trade in your apartment and get a new apartment? Here's a new apartment being delivered. So this would be the uh, core mechanical elevator stairs. Winding around that might be a parking garage and then a framework to plug in the units. And even in the 60s, England was still poor from the collapse of empire and the war. So apartments were pretty minimal. But this minimal apartment, you have a good bathroom, you have your TV unit built into the wall, hold down bed, have everything you need. So here's the tower, spiral ramp for the parking, plug in units, here's the unit being delivered. But this is kind of expensive. And what we want is really the cool imagery. So why don't we just pull in a dirigible, hang down a bunch of bed sheets, get some projectors, and project our city onto the screens. Instant city. Now, what's the next step? What did they not know about? How many people have done the goggles? Virtual reality. Anybody? Cool. It's just getting started. I mean, you're going to be able to stand looking into the Grand Canyon. Whoa! Well, they didn't know about that, but they did have psychedelics. The Enviro pill. How did the Wizard of Oz make the Emerald City emerald. He required that everybody wear green glasses and if the city was emerald. So designer drugs, you can make designer drugs. I mean, you want intense sex, you want colors, you want the music to sound great, you want it to last Two days, you want it to last just 20 minutes. You can specify what you want in a psychedelic and design it. So this is uh, an enviro pill. 
that'll generate the world you want. Now, some influences. Here it is showing up in Pompidou Center by Ken Owen Rogers. And about those plug-in capsules, the Corbusier had proposed that in the 40s, that une habitation would be prefabricated units slipped into structural framework like a wine rack. All the cool ideas up to the 60s, Walt Disney did them. So here's the prefabricated units being slid in. Hang on. Adobe wants me to update. No thanks. Uh, let me get my laser pointer back. So, the Contemporary Hotel at Disney World is a framework. The units are prefabricated down to the furniture, delivered on flatbeds, and a crane just slides them in. Anybody know how the garbage is collected, the trash is collected at Disney World? All right, they open a manhole cover, drop the bag, and whoop! A vacuum tube sucks it down to the incinerator where it's burned to make electricity. So all these cool, oh, another idea of Corbu is you have a pedestrian level in the city. Under that is the service level, all the trucks. That's what they have at Disney World. You walk around, there's a whole other world underneath where Mickey Mouse gets into their costume and then pops up. Now that capsule, what are we looking at here? Over here, somebody had it. It's a first class cabin on an Air Emirates flight from New York to Dubai. Looks exactly like Arthur Graham's capsule. What am I going to show you next? In Japan, they have capsule hotels. So, in Tokyo, Tokyo is surrounded by farmland. And you can't, it's, you can't build it. So you either have to live in Tokyo, it's very crowded and incredibly expensive or outside beyond the farmland, where it's a huge commute. Not that they get any more work done, but Japanese office workers work till 10 o'clock at night to show their enthusiasm. Well, by the time they get home, it'll be time to turn around and go back to work again. So they stay in a hotel. Hotels are incredibly expensive. But all they need is a place to sleep and video conference with their family. So that's a capsule hotel. Okay, key 60s figure, Bucky Fuller. So Fuller did not go to architecture school. He's a Harvard dropout. Went to college, didn't finish. But he's an architect, systems theorist, author, designer, inventor, mathematician, and futurist. He taught a lot of places. Uh, he's lectured at Pratt, didn't teach here. He taught at Penn. He was influential at Kahn when he was teaching at Yale. In 1922, his young daughter died, and he was so upset, he didn't talk for a year. 
but he just thought, what can one person do to make the world better? He came up with a simple idea, doing more with less. Imagine if every machine on Earth were 20% more efficient. We'd all be 20% richer at no extra cost of energy. So he starts thinking about all these things to increase efficiency. So here's his scheme for prefabricated lightweight apartment buildings to be delivered by the ritual and lowered into footings. What did he invent that he's famous for? What's it called? Geodetic dome. Geodetic dome, right. Geodetic dome. So, very lightweight, efficient structure. He designed futurist houses, an aluminum house. After World War II, there was a huge need for housing. We'll talk about that after the break when we get back to Venturi. We get things built like Levittown. People were thinking, is there a way to prefabricate houses? Make them very quickly. We can mass produce automobiles, why not houses? This is a prefab Bucky house and it turns according to the weather and the sun. So if you think of it, yeah. Do you know what it's resting on? Is that like a stone foundation or sand? So like, what's that? Not sure. Probably stone to make it secure. So if you think it would be cool to live in an upside down aluminum pipe plate, this is a house for you. Okay, New York has spikes all the buildings. They maximize surface area, which lose heat in the winter and cooling in the summer. It's like the fins on a motorcycle engine. It's meant to get rid of heat. We don't want to get rid of heat. We want to keep the heat for the cool. How can you increase interior volume and decrease surface area. The sphere, let's put a dome over midtown Manhattan. He has no idea how he's going to build it. It's just a thought idea. He did the United States Pavilion for the Expo 67 in Montreal. And thinking this way, leads to, well, the Earth is a small spaceship. We need an operating manual. So that's one of his books. He'd come to a campus and do a two-year project to, let's rethink the world distribution of energy or food or whatever. And they would produce these volumes of reports Okay, in the 50s and early 60s, advertised on the back of comic books, did you close the window? Was an ant farm. Now, you had to get your own ants, but it's sand and you can watch them working. So a very cool group, and I won't show you, I'll just show you one of their projects, but you can look them up. Name themselves after Ant Farm. This is one of their projects. It's called Cadillac Ranch, Interstate I-40 in Texas. And actually, <laughs> one year I drove to California 
They were driving back. Oh my God, there it is. <laughs> I didn't know we were going to see this before the internet and where you could map stuff out on your phone. But this is every Cadillac that had tail fins from 49 to 63. Fake plastic tires so people won't steal them. So originally, they're full of bullet holes from Texans. And then as there was more uh, Latino influence, they're full of graffiti. So they sort of pick up the culture of the day. <laughs>